Columbus, Georgia, this is your City Council. Mayor, Skip Henderson. City Manager, Isaiah Hughley. Pops Barnes, District 1. Glenn Davis, District 2. Bruce Huff, District 3. Toya Tucker, District 4. Charmaine Crabb, District 5. Gary Allen, Mayor Pro Tem and District 6. Mimi Woodson, District 7. Walker Garrett, District 8. Judy Thomas, Post 9 at Large Counselor. John House, Post 10 at Large Counselor. Sandra Davis, Clerk of Council and City Attorney Clifton Fay. Columbus, Georgia, this is your City Council. Good evening. Whoa, that's way too much Henderson. Let's turn that down just a bit. Uh, good evening and welcome to the March 23rd uh, Council meeting. We're glad to have you join us. Uh, we are gonna begin this meeting as we begin all our meetings. That's by invoking God's presence during these proceedings. So I'd, like to ask, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Reverend Jimmy Elder of First Baptist Church here in Columbus to come forward if he would, please. Jimmy, always good to see you, sir. If you'd... They finally found a way to silence me. That's good. Well, it, was not, it was operator error on this. Do issue. not tell my sound guy at the church, please. Um, Y'all have, have been through a challenging period of time, and you have led our community well, and we're grateful. As a community, we're grateful for what you've done, for what you've offered, for your wisdom, and sometimes the tough decisions. So thank you for who you are. Let's ask God's blessings upon your meeting tonight and know that this just represents a lot of prayers that are offered regularly for you and your leadership and for what you have done for our community. Would you bow with me? Lord, we thank you for a community that we can be proud of, a community where we can live and enjoy each other, and even in the most difficult periods of time, through the midst of a pandemic or a crisis, we know that we are still one, one in community, one in spirit, one in you, as you watch over us and as you care for us. We pray your blessings upon the deliberations in this room and upon each individual life that has been given in service for our community. We pray you'll bless them and that you'll guide them, you'll strengthen them, give them wisdom, and may the days ahead be filled with your grace and your mercy. We remember those in our community who are struggling, and we pray your blessings upon them, and we pray the compassion of this community to reach its arms around them and help them. Thank you for your gifts of love and all that you do. In your precious name, we offer our prayer. Amen. Thank you. Reverend Elder, thank you, sir. And, and thank you so much for being such a friend of Columbus, you and your church. Uh, Y'all have... Y'all have um, left quite a wake behind you as you've moved forward and trying to improve the lives of people in this community. Your mission that you've just opened uh, the, the, uh, on, on North Lumpkin Road, what an amazing facility and what a transformational building that's going to be for the young people that, that uh, have access to it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you. All right, first we'll, uh, hopefully you've had an opportunity to take a look at the minutes. Oh, I did, I forgot the pledge, it's been a while. Please join me in the pledge of the flag. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Almost forgot that. Now, 
We'll, uh, we'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes if you've had an opportunity to review them. Motion from Councilor Tucker, second from Councilor Barnes. Uh, any edits or any questions regarding the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. Minutes are received. Um, our COVID update be relatively brief with regards to the virus, and we'll focus more on the the, um, the vaccination effort that's going on around uh, around our community and around our community and around the um, around the state. Uh, the numbers are are improving. We had had a little bit of a spike the first part of this week, where we got back up to about 60 cases a day, 60 positive cases a day. It drove up our seven-day rolling average and pushed our uh, the threshold of the number of positive cases per 100,000 individuals from 180 back up to about 214. So that's starting to subside again a little bit. And I've, in talking with our friends at uh, DPH, that's not that unexpected simply because of the different variants that are now available uh, and, and are, are prevalent throughout uh, the communities. And the fact that a lot of the young people, frankly, they're getting spring fever. They, they, uh, they're getting out and getting involved in and, and uh, something close to what normal was uh, will pass for. But it is, it is a very good indicator uh, of this community's health that uh, we have plateaued and have been plateaued for, for a couple of weeks at, in our hospitalization rate. Uh, we've stayed uh, at around 35 to 42 at any one time in our hospitals. That's a blended rate. That's all the hospital rooms in Columbus. So that's the number we kind of watch and we feel uh, more confidence the lower that, that number goes. Uh, by now everybody knows that GEMA has stood up uh, a mass vaccination site. It's one of nine in the state of Georgia. It's one of the, I think it's the largest in the state of Georgia. Uh, and they are, have been busy uh, vaccinating individuals 55 and older. And for those of you that saw the governor's uh, message this evening, effective Thursday, the day after tomorrow, we will begin vaccinating everybody 16 years of age and older. So this is very good news because it's, uh, it, although it may make it a little bit tougher to get a time slot, uh, it is great news because we're gonna be putting more vaccine in more arms. And that's gonna go a long way towards making sure that come summertime in Columbus, Georgia, we are uh, very close to back, back to pre-COVID normal, uh, we hope. Uh, so I would urge you to uh, go to uh, myvaccinegeorgia.com and uh, select Columbus as your site, and then follow the prompts to go ahead and, uh, and reserve a spot to get, um, to get your vaccine. Um, we've also been continuing with uh, local vaccinations. Uh, DPH, our partnership with DPH, and I, I see Chance Corbett here, our uh, Deputy Director of Emergency Management. He has done just an absolutely fantastic job at uh, coordinating and, and working with all of these different partners because they all have a little different way of how they're administering and, and, and taking reservations for the administering of the, the vaccine. Uh, but we've had something going at um, our rec centers every day this week. We'll continue vaccinating people all the way. I think it's scheduled up through Saturday. Uh, I think tomorrow is a, I believe it's Wednesday chance, the massive uh, second dose vaccination site uh, will be at Peachtree Mall. Uh, so we're utilizing every opportunity we can to try to get out into the neighborhoods and make sure that, uh, the, um, th that everybody has an opportunity to access the vac vaccine. Uh, chance, do you have anything to add? with regards to the vaccination effort? <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, just uh, real quick, I, I know you mentioned tomorrow. Tomorrow, uh, we're still in the, in the recreation centers. Uh, today was uh, Frank Chester, tomorrow is Gallops, and, and Thursday is Shirley Winston. Friday is the actual Peachtree Mall Day. Um, That'll be the day that we get the second shot in arms from the large 1,580 clinic that we did at the Civic Center one month to the day. So we're excited about that one. We're anticipating a big crowd at that one. All those are pre-registered as well. But um, DPH has been doing an absolute wonderful job. In fact, we're challenging them with new sites and new, new things, and they're, they're up to the task. They're ready to go. So I've, uh, 
you know, we're, we're just excited that the, the governor opened it up to 16 and older, and we're, we're really looking for lines at the Civic Center. Thank Very you. good. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, the bottom line is for everybody that wants a vaccine, uh, certainly after Thursday, uh, there there's, shouldn't be much of an excuse for them not to be able to get one. Uh, so we we are uh, we appreciate the efforts of everybody in this community because everybody's been doing their part. I will urge you, though, even once you've been vaccinated, to continue to use your mask, continue to follow the uh, common sense guidelines that CDC has handed out, and that is uh, socially distance. If you can't socially distance, wear a mask and make sure you take uh, a few extra minutes uh, in, in making sure that you've washed your hands and kept your, your uh, hygiene uh, at a level where it, it will make things easier to stop the spread. So we thank you for doing your part. Thank you, Chance. Thank you. All right. All right, the next, uh, next on the agenda, we have a transition audit uh, report uh, on the Mar Marshal's office. Uh, Mr. Redmond, John Redmond, our auditor, will um, present it. Thank you, Mayor, Mr. Manager, members of council, Madam Clerk, Mr. Attorney. It's good to see you again this evening. Tonight I'd like to report on the transition and really a decommissioning audit of the Marshal's Office that occurred earlier this year, or at the end of last year, it's right in there crossing over. Um, the Marshal's Office was audit was authorized on, um, let me go ahead and do that. All right, y'all done messed me up. It was authorized by City Council on January 26th of this year. Um, the Departmental Audit for decommissioning the Marshal's Office and preparing for its inclusion in the Sheriff's Office. Uh, part of what we needed to do was verification of employees, uh, identification of vehicles, capital equipment, weapons and ammunition. And of course, uh, the process as usual, it was the authorization of the audit, development of an audit program, an entrance conference with the auditee, and then conducting the field work. And then of course, the preparation of the draft report and an exit conference with the auditee so he could have his input. And then of course, we got the auditee response and then prepared the final report. And tonight we're presenting to city council. The audit findings, the verification of employees, all employees in the marshal's office were verified and found to be where they were supposed to be and those on the payroll. Uh, the budgetary performance we looked at, they were within budget for the past three years and the current year to date, so it was a half year when, up to December 31. Uh, we verified all the vehicles and other capital assets and we also verified and assigned and the, uh, the assigned and reserved weapons and ammunition. Uh, I will have to say the office was well organized and prepared for the decommissioning. Uh, the assigned staff, uh, uh, Marshal Countryman and Sheriff Countryman, uh, were very much in place. Uh, they made it work like clockwork. It's kind of like the, the shot lines down at the Civic Center. They had everything. We, we were auditing the, each of the vehicles and their weaponry. They came right up to us and drove right past and we were able to take care of all that very quickly. So it was quite easy. Um, the, the, the day ended on December 31st with a decommissioning ceremony. and It was conducted on that last day. Uh, we have no recommendations. Uh, the good news was that all of the information that needed to be transferred uh, and records relative to the marshal's office could be transferred to the sheriff's office and uh, so there were no recommendation, and the RT agrees with the findings, and they were a perfect report. So any questions? Yes, Councillor Thomas. Yes. Uh, Mr. Redmond, uh, were the, um, the weapons and the vehicles all moved over to the sheriff's office? Uh, that's, that was the plan, yes, ma'am. They had not been moved at the time we did the inventory, but we, we physically saw the ones that were assigned to the individual deputies and, and command staff. Uh, we inventoried those by serial number. Uh, Donna McGinnis worked with me on that. Um, then we uh, also checked the ones that they had in the trunks of their cars, their extra weapons, and usually 
a rifle, a shotgun, and then we went over to the, actually to their marshal's office and we inventoried the ones that were on the racks, the reserve weapons, and also the, the, uh, we inventoried the ammunition that they had there. And do you by chance know if um, all of the uh, marshal, the deputy marshals transferred to the sheriff's office? It's my understanding they all transferred, except I believe one was retiring at the end of the year, so that one would not have transferred. But And so those folks would take their weapon and their vehicle with them, I would assume. Yes, ma'am, and I think they pro they probably going to recondition or repaint the, the vehicle so they'd match the ones in the sheriff's office, as yeah. I understand. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Doesn't appear so, John. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, before we move on to the um, city attorney's gender, uh, agenda, we want to wish Councillor Glenn Davis a happy birthday. His birthday's March 28th. Is that right? Yeah, so happy birthday to Councillor Davis. And happy birthday to Councillor uh, Crabb, uh, wherever she is. No, she <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the city attorney's off, uh, agenda. Hey, thank you, Mayor. We have got some zoning hearings required this evening. The uh, first one up is the JMC Flat Rock Partners petition. There is a revised proposed amendment around the table. I think Mayor Pertem was prepared to offer it, but we can see if other uh, councilors will offer that up. This is going from a single family and neighborhood commercial to general commercial with very specific conditions. Is a and Mr. Whiteman's here. Yes. See through the mask and uh, first, let's see if there are any questions around the table. Any counselors have a question? No, sir. Doesn't appear so. All right. Anybody else in the audience want to be heard on this petition for or against? Applicant, Mr. Oh, I'm White. I'm sorry, Councillor, Councillor Huff. Okay. Yeah, I just had one question. Everything was worked out with Gary ahead of time? Yes, sir. Uh, we had two meetings with the HOA of Maple Ridge, and as a matter of fact, there's one representative here, and we mapped out, I believe, what is in front of y'all as uh, uh, an addendum to the ordinance that uh, the developers and the HOA agreed to. Yeah, I'm fine. I just knew he was absent, so I just want to make sure you all were together. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Right. City Attorney, was there supposed to be, was, was there going to be a, here, here comes Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. <clears throat> Right, you've got around the table the proposed amendment with 10 specific conditions in it, and Mayor Pro Tem may want to comment. We need a motion in any event. Yeah, I apologize for being a little late. Um, we, as, as Chris Whiteman said, we've met twice with the, uh, the uh, homeowners associations. We've added three amendments to the, to the list, items two, nine, and 10. Um, and I think everybody's in agreement with that, and I would appreciate council's consideration to uh, approve those amendments as added. Okay. Can, can you make that a motion to add the proposed amendment, to substitute the proposed amendment? Yes, sir. We'll do it. All right. All right. There's a motion second to substitute uh, the proposed amendment that is on your desk. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no? All right, it is approved. Okay, and Mr. Whiteman, this will all be on um, second reading at the first regular meeting in April. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Mr. City Attorney. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. All right, petition number two is the zoning atlas change at 2925 Manchester <laughs> Expressway. I think Mr. Mize is here on this one, the Icarus petition. This is the old Best Buy property. He wants to go to general 
uh, from general commercial to light manufacturing industrial. Mr. Mize, do you want to comment? Sure. Go ahead and tell okay. them. Since this is a matter of community interest with the old Best Buy, just okay. tell them what's planned. Absolutely. I just hit this button, the green button. Right? Okay. Good evening. How are y'all today? Um, my name is George Myers. I'm with the law firm of Page Crinham, uh, 111 Bay Avenue, 11141 Bay Avenue. I'm here today representing your applicant, which is Icarus Alternative Investments. Icarus is a real estate firm primarily focused on repurposing old, out of date commercial developments and turning them into updated commercial developments. Uh, Icarus has been in business since 2016. Its founder, Alex Oliver, has experienced since 2012. And since that time, he's developed and acquired over 2 million square feet of Class A office space, suburban office space, and industrial assets. And Alex is here with me today. Let's see, we got, how do I go backwards now? Let's see. <laughs> All right, so we're not going to get any cooperation out of the technology. <laughs> I just want to go back to that. I'll, I'll try not to mess with that. Okay, thank you. Boy, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, this is the site plan, and what we're seeking to rezone is approximately 7.7 .7 acres of land. It's located at the northeast quadrant of the intersection of I-185 and Manchester Expressway. This is the old Best Buy project, uh, and we're going to be rezoning it from GC to its prior classification of LMI. And the purpose for the rezoning is to repurpose and redevelop essentially a, a vacant and deteriorating Best Buy building into a last mile distribution or fulfillment center. Uh, and our request has been approved by both the planning department as well as unanimously approved by PAC. This development is consistent and compatible, or this proposed development is consistent and compatible with surrounding land uses. As you can see from the zoning map, hope so, um, really what's shaded in purple is LMI, and the, and the little gold star at the northeast quadrant the intersection of I-185 and Manchester Expressway is a subject property. And you can see pretty much everything to the north and northeast is already zoned LMI. This is the airport, and it's also the related and supporting businesses. Uh, to the east, uh, is a very large commercial development known as Peachtree Mall and all of its out parcels. Uh, to the west and south, the major arterial highways in I-185 and Manchester Expressway. Noting along the south side of Manchester Expressway, a substantial amount of LMI is there. Historically, this property was zoned LMI when it served as home for Connect Dairies, later Parmalat, before it became Best Buy. But what my client's seeking to do, as I've said, is repurpose and redevelop the existing vacant Best Buy into a last mile distribution or fulfillment center. And this is exactly what Icarus does. They do redevelopments and I've got some, some photographs or some renderings of projects that they're currently involved in or projects that they have done. This first one is an abandoned dealership that they're turning into a lift driver support center. I've got a picture of what existed prior to them. We've got some, some renderings of what will be there, both the exterior and the interior. Uh, we've also got uh, photographs of an older vintage office complex that's been turned into a millennial working hub. And that's a picture of what it looks like. And then we have also uh, a single storage warehouse facility that now is a fully leased office, single story office complex. But Alex will take the, the current building, he'll convert it into a vibrant business and he'll do a substantial facelift, including repainting, rebranding and landscaping. The property is serviced by all necessary public facilities and infrastructure. Uh, there will be no additional investment on the city's part in that regard, nor will there be any additional, or nor will there be any adverse impact to those facilities and infrastructure, nor will there be any adverse impact to traffic. Uh, with the possible concerns about traffic, we did retain a traffic engineer by the name of Vern Wilburn, somebody who I believe is familiar to the planning department, but we asked Vern to prepare a trip generation study to compare the number of trips generated by the proposed use compared to what they were when, there was a, when it was a Best Buy store. And as you can see, and it's just real quickly, the previous Best Buy store generated about 1,847 trips a day. 
whereas the last mile distribution center generates about 368 trips a day or less than 20 percent of the previous use. And even if you expanded the last mile distribution center by roughly 50 percent, you're still talking about less than 30 percent of the trips that were generated when it was an old Best Buy store. We also believe the rezoning uh, request will have a very positive economic impact on the city and its citizens, including the creation of numerous construction jobs during about a six-month renovation period, together with a substantial increase in business for local suppliers, subcontractors, electricians, plumbers, and others who support the construction industry. And then once the project is up and running, we anticipate generating over 100 permanent jobs. The Office of Development provides a substantial increase in the tax base for abalone tax purposes, thus providing a substantial economic return to the city, again, without adversely affecting any existing infrastructure uh, or, or without requiring any additional investment on the city's part. In fact, we anticipate increasing property taxes by over 50 percent. Uh, in addition, there will be a substantial increase in sales tax receipts in connection with the purchase and sale of millions of dollars of construction materials. We believe our rezoning requests and application meet all the requirements for rezoning. The LMI classification certainly consists and compatible with surrounding land uses. Uh, all public facilities and infrastructure at the site, there be no negative impact to those facilities and infrastructure or to traffic. And we believe this development have great benefit to the community, both in terms of tax generation and job creation. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you for that explanation. Let's see if there's any questions in the audience. Anybody want to comment on the petition? Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Very important. Katie, the cow will not be harmed in any way. And in fact, if y'all remember, the city has an easement to maintain Katie, the cow, so, so that's not in jeopardy. My granddaughter asked about that. The cow easement will be undisturbed. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Very now, Mayor, the only other question I have, and the consent agenda, Mr. City Manager, we could bring this back or next week at the work session, consent agenda, or wait to the first meeting in uh, April. I don't know if there's a preference. Hmm? Mr. City Manager? Uh, with no uh, apparent opposition, uh, we, we, we can just bring it on the consent agenda. All right. If council's good with that, we can, Mr. Jones, if you would also let Mr. Whiteman know, we could bring back the Flat Rock also on second reading. Mr. Mize, thank you for being thank here on this much. one. But next week at 9 o'clock, they'll take a vote. That's a work session. But I won't need to be, I won't be present, correct? You don't need to be. Okay. Thank no. you very much. Thank you. All right, the next uh, zoning item is the Unified Development Ordinance Proposed Text Amendment. Mr. Jones, you want to briefly describe this? Good evening. This is, this is the planning department's effort to get ahead of the game here, uh, to kind of jumpstart. We were contacted approximately about three months ago, maybe four now, uh, from the <clears throat> excuse me from the Chamber of Commerce, that saying that they had a potential uh, new industry coming into the community, and it was basically dealing with marijuana in terms of the actual growth and cultivation and manufacturing and, and putting aside for that, nothing nothing for the, any illegal services here, just really for municipal value for the most part involved with all that, and they were looking at actually some sites in our existing uh, industrial area for that to happen. Well, we really don't have anything that really necessarily covers that, particularly in industrial areas. And this is our attempt here to make sure that if, if that happens, it, we will be prepared for that. The understanding of, from the standpoint now that uh, there will be six of these uh, basically licenses given to uh, different groups throughout the state. Uh, this one group has made application for it. Uh, in, involved with all that. Uh, we're, they were supposed to hear something here in the, in the very near future in terms about whether they'll get, the, they'll be granted one of the, the permits or licenses to, to actually control the, this and, man, and manufacture this, this marijuana, which means on, on, for the most part, of course, the growth of that as well. And I think I read somewhere in here where it was like they could have up to like 400,000 square feet of, of green space for that to happen. So they actually, would actually grow the, the product on, on site. Of course, they'd have to also provide the security for it as well 
involved with all that, but it, it would be for again for medicinal value and for medicinal use. So, our, this is our attempt to make sure we stay out ahead of this process, and if they should they come about, we'll be ready for them to come into the community and provide some additional jobs as well in, in terms of doing this product. Councilor Garrett. I'd like to make a motion to recuse myself because I'm an investor in one of the companies applying for the licenses. Okay. It's a motion to uh, recuse Councilor Garrett. Is there a second? Second from Mayor Pro Tem. All in favor say aye. Any opposed no? Yeah. Well, that's fine. There won't be any vote tonight on the, the matter, but Councilor Garrett can certainly recuse next week. But I don't. I, I think if he's got a direct investment, um, doesn't he have to abstain from discussion as well? In other words, the mm -hmm. discussion needs to take place without him that, in the room. That would be appropriate. If he wants to head to the back of the room right now, this shouldn't take but a couple more minutes. Just want to make sure we're doing it right. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Jones, uh, what else? Was that? That's it. That was your comments. Well, yes, let's comment. see if there's anybody in the audience uh, that wants to comment on this proposed text change for or against. Any hands? Okay. Any other questions around the table? All right. Again, as Mr. Jones said, this is just preparing for possible licensing of facilities around the state and a possible applicant. This is uh, legalized license activity now in the state of Georgia. We'll bring this back on the consent agenda for a vote next week. Mayor, I'm gonna call up the next three items together. We've got some, I know Ms. Hinton from the Waterworks, the finance director <coughs> over there. She is present. These are resolutions authorizing uh, clean water state revolving fund loans, uh, 13.3 24.7, 22.439 from the Georgia Environmental Finance Authority. And we'll let Ms. Hinton make a few comments on that. And these technically have to be approved by the council. Good evening, Mayor Henderson, members of council, city manager, and city attorney. My name is Alex Hinton. I'm in financial services at the Columbus Waterworks. We're here to request, as the city attorney said, council approval for the loans with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund and the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund, administered by the Georgia Environmental Finance Authority, or GFA, in the following amounts. The Clean Water State Revolving Fund for $24,705,000. The Clean Water State Revolving Fund for $13,300,000. The Drinking Water State Revolving Fund for $22,439,000. For a total of $60,000,000 or $444,000. These loans are part of the planning of Columbus Waterworks for our CIP and under our master planning process to maintain our water and wastewater infrastructure. We explored both bond funding and state revolving funding to fund these projects. Currently, GFA offers a discount for water first communities and CWW or Columbus Water Works has been designated as a water first community. It reduces the rate of, one, um, of their normal 1.13%, a reduction of 1%, therefore resulting in an interest rate for a 20-year loan of 0.13%. In, in a comparison to bond funding, this is an estimated savings of over $17 million. This funding assumption was included in our rate model planning projections during prior year. We are very excited to obtain this funding at the 0.13%. I'll turn it back to you, or I don't know if I need to request okay. approval. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Thank Mr. You. City Manager, do you have some comments? Uh, yes, sir. Um, just um, a few 
comments just for the record. Um, uh, the Columbus Consolidated Government um, is not guaranteeing uh, the loan. It is not guaranteeing, we are not guaranteeing the loan. Um, the, the agreement is payable, payable from revenues and rates of the Columbus Water Works and you just heard her say that it was included in their rate model. Um, they have to maintain a reserve and a 1.25 debt coverage. Uh, the city is agreeing that it will not interfere with uh, Columbus Water Works in revenue raising power if needed to meet the debt obligations because we are not guaranteeing the loan. And so this is um, in the hands of uh, the Water Works if, if that should come about. But I just wanted to make clear that it's not being guaranteed by the city. Very good. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve the resolutions? Motion from Council Garrett and second from the Mayor Pro Tem. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Any opposed, no. They are approved. Alex, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hinton. All right, the uh, next item is a resolution commending Ms. Eleanor White on an amazing 65 years of service to Columbus and 30 years of service on the Board of Elections. Mayor Pro Tem Allen, um, I don't know if anybody from the family is here, but you can. They are. They are. Okay, come on up. I have a copy. It's come on up to the podium, please. And Mayor Pro Tem, you can read this into the record, please, sir. It's on ECA. You got it? You need a copy? So you got it. Yeah. Welcome. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Um, when I was first elected, Miss Eleanor was one of the one of those that I met initially. Um, she was director of one of our parks and rec uh, locations, and she was she was very good to me. Um, I introduced myself, and she said, "Oh, I know who you are." And she reminded me of that over and over and over. Uh, she gave me advice. She was not shy about giving you advice, and I really appreciated her friendship. And then she went on to serve Columbus. Uh, as you'll see when I read this, uh, on the Board of Elections for a number of years, a total of, I believe, 65 years. Uh, and we really appreciate her, her service and our, our sympathies to the family of, uh, that she had to step down due to health reasons, but uh, we, we want you to know our hearts are with you. It's my privilege to publish the resolution which reads as follows. Whereas Ms. Eleanor White of Columbus, Georgia has served her community diligently and faithfully for 65 years, whereas Ms. White began her career with Columbus, Georgia on February 25, 1955 as a part-time playground director with the Department of Recreation. She went on to serve in several capacities for the Department of Parks and Recreation and ultimately taking the position of Administrative Assistant Internal Affairs on July 1, 1985, whereas Ms. White retired from her full-time employment with the City of Columbus on December 31st, 1990, after 35 years of service, whereas this council appointed Ms. White as a member of the Muskogee County Board of Elections and Registration in November of 1991, and she has continued to serve in that capacity for almost 30 years, whereas Ms. White has also faithfully served as an elections worker for every election since November 3rd, 1998, and whereas Ms. White has recently announced her intention to retire from her post on the Board of Elections. Now, therefore, the Council of Columbus, Georgia hereby resolves, this council hereby expresses its appreciation for the diligent, faithful, and meritorious service of Miss Eleanor White in so many capacities for 65 years. Let a copy of this resolution be furnished to Miss Eleanor White as an expression and appreciation of this council and the citizens of Columbus, Georgia for her service. 
I move the adoption. All right, there's a motion second to adopt. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, no? It passes. What an incredible legacy to put that much work into serving the people of Columbus and Muskogee County. Uh, I'll say a few words, and I know Ms. Bourne is there. She's going to want to as well. Uh, no, I was just going to say thank you and accept a uh, resolution on behalf of my mother. She's unable to attend today, but thanks again. And she's doing good. Thank you, sir. Anyone else want to share some words? So Ms. White was one of the first people that I met about 34 years ago when I started my career with the city. We worked right next door to each other. I was in the coroner's office and she was in Parks and Recreation. And just as Councillor Allen said, she knew everybody. And if you need to, needed to know the history, needed to know where they came from, you went to Ms. White and she knew that information. She carried that over from Parks and Recreation, of course, to the Board of Elections. I could always depend on her to proofread the minutes for us um, and make amendments to those and changes to those. And she always supported the Board of Elections and sometimes made strong decisions that were not popular, but you could always depend on Ms. White to make the correct decision and we're gonna miss her presence on the board. Thank you. Councillor Huff. To the family, congratulations. Please uh, let her know how we feel about her. But uh, also let her know, I remember the last conversation I had with her regarding the Board of Elections. She was just finishing a good meal at Longhorns and she thanked us, th thanked me to let the council know she was very thankful that she had been reelected and that she was going to serve as long as she could and she was praying then that she could make it through the term. She said she had some health issues that had come about uh, that she didn't realize was coming on her so fast. So tell her we appreciate all that she's done for the city and for all of us and that we all ask about it and we all are praying for her to uh, get control of the health issues and just live a good, normal life and enjoy herself the rest of the days here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councilor Thomas. Uh, I'd like for the other members of the family to introduce themselves and if any of them would like to, to say anything. Yes, my name is Bronwyn Hughes, and Eleanor White is my aunt, and I just want to say thank you again for recognizing her. I remember when I was a child growing up, and she used to take me to the playground with her every day, and I had to stay until it was time to leave and do what she told me to do, So, and we're still doing that. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Pat White, her daughter-in-law, and Mrs. White, loved what she did. She loved serving. And on her behalf today, I would just like to say thank you for the recognition that she's been given today. And um, hopefully she's seeing this um, where she is. But anyway, I just want to say thank you all and let you know that she really enjoyed holding the positions that she had in her job through those 35 years. So thank you again. Good afternoon, I'm Zacharis Jakes, and I was adopted into the family. <laughs> Mrs. White was my Sunday school teacher, and I'm 76. And her firmness has really guided me through life, and you knew that she meant what she said, and she was a good person and a hard worker. And I'm here today to say that she always talked about Nancy, and the young lady that stands directly behind me. She introduced me to her, but I can't remember her name. But she said that the Board of Elections and Nancy took care of her. So I want to thank you for having us here today and tell you that you really missed a dedicated worker. Well, to the family, we hope you'll convey to Ms. White just our deepest appreciation for all that she's done. And I would argue, and I bet Ms. Bourne would argue, that maybe it was her that did the taking care of the Board of Elections. 
And I, and I apologize, we, we have a copy and somehow it didn't make it to the meeting tonight. We'll get you a signed copy uh, that reflects the sentiment of this council in recognizing her and we'll get it to you. Thank you all very much. All right, thank you all for being here. Mayor, we have one more add-on resolution that's around the table, uh, Ms. Boren also needs this one for her office. This relates to the untimely passing of Mr. Mike Edmondson on the school board, and this would set a qualifying fee for the special election to fill that vacancy, and it's ready for adoption. There's a motion from the Mayor Pro Tem, a second from Councilor Tucker. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. All right, that is passed. Thank you, Mayor. That's all we had listed tonight. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney. We'll move into the um, public agenda. And first, we have Ms. Pat Frey representing the United Way of the Chattahoochee Valley Home for Good uh, regarding the 2021 point in time count results. And Ms. Frey, good to see you. I, what we will do is I will, after you introduce yourself and give your uh, address, we'll start the timer and you'll have five minutes. Thank you, sir. Pat Frey, uh, United Way, Chattahoochee Valley, Home for Good, 2475 Y Street. Um, just quickly want to give you some numbers uh, as they are right now. These are tentative numbers until we hit submit on our final submission to the Department of Housing and Urban Development. But it looks like this year's point in time count, which we, again, assess the, uh, the numbers of unsheltered and sheltered homeless in our community, is down four from last year. In the midst of a global pandemic, we were just hoping to break even. Um, but the fact that we were down four individuals um, from last year, from uh, uh, 249 last year to uh, 245 this year. Um, the numbers of females versus males, um, f about 45% of those experiencing homelessness are females, about 55 are males. Our number of children experiencing homelessness is once again down this year from last year. Um, we've seen a three-year trend of that going down, which we're very excited about. The number of veterans in our, in our community that are experiencing homelessness this year um, was at seven, which was down 14 from last year with uh, 21 last year, and those who are chronically homeless, meaning they've been on the streets for more than a year, and they have a disabling condition, that was only 18 this year, and that's down from 25 from last year. Um, overall, we've got 10 pages of statistics and all, because we break it down to the, to the client level of everything imaginable. But I wanted to say, with the, with the help of 40 volunteers this year from organizations, um, private citizens, many of our corporate partners, many city, uh, city employees and, and all going out and, and, and hitting the streets and the shelters. It was, it was made possible and we did it um, in the middle of, of, of the coldest days, of course, in, in Columbus, Georgia of the year. We seem to pick those two days every year. Um, we also had wonderful support from our sheriff's department and our police department. Um, and that's not unusual in this community. Many of the directives we're seeing now from agencies at the federal and state level are saying that you need to have more participation and more collaboration with your law enforcement and bringing, bringing housing providers together with law enforcement to make um, to build bridges and to make homelessness not a crime, but to be able to empower people to make connections and make referrals. Guys, we, we're ahead of the ball game here in Columbus. That's never been an issue. And I and I'm, can honestly say since January 1st, it's only gotten better. So thanks to Sheriff Countryman, you know, thanks to Chief Blackman. I mean, we, it's literally a text message or a phone call away and we meet the needs of people where they are, and I mean we, meaning we. It's, it's not a one organization, it's not a one person, it's meeting the needs of the community. Um, and these numbers that we have collected, again, are people, and we'll be using these, this data and these numbers and the statistics to help us use our CARES funding that we have for rapid rehousing so that we can take these folks from homelessness to housed. I'll take any questions. Pat, if you would speak about how the, um, the homeless population 
uh, was impacted by COVID, uh, did we have many cases within that population? We have had less than a handful of cases, and I'm glad you brought it up, Mr. Mayor. Maybe my time will restart now. But um, we are actually working with DPH to have a vaccination clinic at our safe house at 2101 Hamilton Road. Dr. Sante Hiltz is working with myself, um, with, with Mercy Med and with Safe House to make sure we get vaccinations to the folks who can't do the drive through or whatever. And we're trying to do the one dose so we don't have to worry about the, the, the tracking someone down for coming back for the second dose. So yes, we've had a, less than a handful of, of cases. Fantastic. Yeah, and you had shared that with me. I just wanted you to make that statement publicly. It's quite a statement uh, dealing with the population, uh, the difficulties that you've had, I think, trying to make sure that everybody's taken care of. Uh, I know it's, it's a team effort, uh, but every team needs a good coach, and you've been an outstanding leader and coach for that team. So thank you for what you do in serving those that need service the most. Thank you, sir. Thank you for allowing us to do it. Thank you, ma'am. All right, next is uh, Ms. Jennifer Ledeni regarding public safety compression pay, missing persons with disability, and GCAL. Uh, Ms. Ledeni, uh, same, same deal. You've got five minutes. I'll try to give you a signal when you've got one minute left, and, uh, and I won't start the timer until after you introduce yourself and give your address. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lee Denny. My address is 2440 Diane Avenue. And first of all, I want to apologize for my absence last meeting. Um, my speaking engagement with Senate Appropriations was moved up, and we just needed to set the tone that we're just finished waiting for services for our individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I'm hard on everybody. Don't feel bad. Um, tonight, I come before you with three areas of concern. And like you said, compression pay and public safety, vulnerable missing persons, and GCAL. Um, one that hits heart for me um, is going to be the pay studies. They've been done multiple times. It's to my understanding that the decision for a new one was tabled, which is understandable. And there was overall 2% raise, which is, you know, we appreciate that. The one thing I'm having yet to understand is why do we raise entry level pay while leaving the veteran employees stagnant. 2% is good, but that's not going, that's not comparable with the years of service. Um, examples are we have field training officers um, in the police department that are still training rookies, entry level police officers that are making more than they are. Um, we're talking about significantly. We're not talking about little differences here. Another is the fire department has some of the hardest working administrative personnel. And they are still the lowest administrative personnel in the entire city. They are working the job of more than one position, but yet they are expected to continue at their pay. Um, another thing is the deductions are still way too much on the paychecks. And thank you for not raising it when the raises were done like it has been in the past. Um, for example, yes, this might be dated, but they are so um, significant. My husband was one of only two post-certified crime scene technicians with the Muscogee County Sheriff's Office. He left a position that was $40,000 on paper for a job that was only $29,000, 29, yeah, thousand dollars with Columbus Tech. He actually brought home $200 more in take-home pay. Those numbers don't add up, y'all. They don't. So I'll leave you with that. We need to make sure when we do these raises, they're more comprehensive, that they go by years of service, that that will show the employees that they are being appreciated, especially those who have to work the trenches of public safety. Um, the next, and I do appreciate Chief Blackman speaking with me um, earlier before the meeting, is missing persons with special needs or intellectual disabilities. I do want to thank everyone's efforts for finding King Heart. Um, this was the first one I was personally involved with. Um, I normally just post the missing um, posts when they come on Facebook. I do want to request a meeting with you, Mayor, Chief Blackman, and um, Sheriff Countryman, because I think we need to fine tune this a little bit better. 
um, I would like to start with a meeting with um, the Hart family so we can learn from this experience. Um, there are things that we already have established, like the care cards and Project Lifesaver, which some, even in, within the departments, don't know about. A lot of people in the communities don't know about them as well. And this will prevent some of the unnecessary heartache that we have been lucky and blessed enough to avoid. There are also some misunderstandings that took place. That's something I think that requires a meeting, not something to be aired in a council meeting. So I would like to include the Hart family so we can learn from their experiences, so we can air that and improve on the process when we engage in, with the family of the missing individual. Um, also, I want to touch on GCAL, something that I have learned about since being involved more in the legislation set, late legislative session is how if we do not use our services and resources, they are quick to go. They tried to remove family support services last year. GCAL's number, and I want to announce it because some people don't know about it, Georgia Crisis Access Line is 1-800-715-4225. GCAL provides assistance and resources to individuals affected by mental health, substance abuse, and intellectual disabilities in and after crises. A lot of people are not aware of the after part. I think one way we can start bringing resources into our communities and get that heavy lifting off of our public safety is to start introducing these families to GCAL. It's a simple, this is a number. No, we cannot wait for them because sometimes the response time is long. But this is a number and they can see you afterwards. They can see you after they come out of jail. They can see you after they come out of the mental health facility. They can see you after they find them. They need to know that these people are held accountable to provide services from the state. Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities Ms. Ms. Ledenny, has been lacking. I'm, I apologize, ma'am. I'm sorry, but you, you, your five minutes has expired. And, and what okay. you, can, you can stay if you like, because at, at the end of the clerk's meeting, you can come back for another three minutes. And I think this is a significantly important topic that you're talking about. So okay. if you've got the time, I mean, if you don't mind waiting for just you know, a little bit more. I'll be glad to do so. There's All only right. just a little bit more, so I'll be glad to finish up. That'd be great. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. All right, and next is Mr. Timothy Carter regarding the various activities occurring at Carver Park. Mr. Carter, welcome, sir. And, and again, uh, five minutes. I'll try to signal you when you've got one minute left, and I won't start the timer until after you've introduced yourself and given your address. Good evening. My name is Tim Carter. I live at 6744 Mitchell Drive. That's in the King Ridge subdivision adjacent to Carver Park. Within Carver Park, what I'm calling this Park Gores, they constantly come to Carver Park on Sundays. And they create a lot of noise, they allow music. They are uh, during wheelies, where they burning, a, burning in rubber with their tires. Uh, one Sunday, they burnt so much rubber, you could see the smoke coming out of the park and the stench from burnt rubber was just horrendous. This is not a new problem, it's an ongoing problem. In the 1990s, the uh, Columbus Police Department, the news media, as well as members of the council met at Carver Park. Uh, council member Mimi Woodson, she was one of those uh, council members that was at the park. Out of that, out of that meeting, and that meeting in Carver Park, the step was taken to limit the amount of park goers. They installed barriers that limit the amount of park goers. Since then, those barriers has been uh, either deteriorated or been removed. So now, all the park goers, they come back in groves. I've spoken with uh, Miss Becky Gleason of Columbus Parks and Recs, and she had told me that she had put in the budget to hire park rangers. And I think that would be a great thing to get the park rangers back. Being that the sheriff, I mean, the marshal's office is being disbanded, you have officers that's already on the payroll. You can take some of those officers and assign them to duties as park rangers. 
along with the park goers, is the amount of gunfire that's going on in the park. I was recently painting my house, and I'm digging bullets out of, the, out of my home from bullets that's coming from the park. My wife has gotten so scared, she's talking about maybe we need to move. I'm not moving out of my home simply because we have park goers. The thing about the park, and I understand it's a, park, it's a public park, but to patronize the park is just like driving your automobile. It's not a right, it's a privilege. And once that privilege has been abused, it needs to be revoked. There are, in, in the 80s, 1980s, at Benning Road, you had Benning Park. The citizens of Benning Park, I mean, of that community, they complained so much what the city did was put up signs limiting a certain part of the, of the park. They made it off limits. After that didn't work, they closed the park entirely. There is no more Benning Park. They closed that section of park. I'm not saying we need to close Carver Park, but steps need to be taken to prevent the level of lawlessness that is taking place today. I've spoken with Chief Blackman, and he told me that he's, his department is going to do their part. However, Columbus Police Department cannot sit on the park 24-7. It ain't just the park goers. Monday through Friday, you have four wheelers and dirt bikes ripping up the park, tearing up the ground. If you go to the park now, all you're going to see is tire tracks where they've been burning rubber. The, the district attorney was arrested because he had people at the Civic Center, and y'all said that they burnt rubber in the city parking lot at the Civic Center. But no one is taking any steps to prevent what's happening in Culver Park. And I'm certain. If this problem was taking place at places like Cooper Creek, Wairacoba Park, Britt David Park, and so on, this issue would have been addressed and dealt with. But we are having to endure it. Now, Ms. Becky told me that they have putting up gates to close the park at 7 o'clock. Well, that's fine. And I applaud that effort. That is great. However, that does nothing to stop the, the amount of noise that has taken place prior to 7 o'clock when you close the park. We still have to endure that. We still have to endure the amount of gunshots that is fired on a random basis in the park. So you got dirt bikes, folk wheelers, and the park is also being used for target practice. It's a public park. It's not a shooting range. It's not a dirt bike track. It's a privilege to be able to go to the park, not a right. And with that, that's all I have for the council. Any questions? Mr. Carter, thank you. Yes, Toya Tuck, uh, Councilor Tucker. Thank you, Mr. Carter, for coming tonight and discussing this matter um, with the council and mayor. And I appreciate our talk prior to the meeting to let me know exactly you know what was going on in the park um, i'm i'm breaking my brain trying to come up with some solutions um, to basically ensure that you have the best quality of life at your home and not only you but the individuals that live in that area so continue to keep me informed i'm actually gonna ask the city attorney to give me some, um, possibly an ordinance. Is there an ordinance in reference to dirt bikes and four wheelers in reference to riding um, in public areas like parks? I think there are some, Counselor. Um, you can certainly restrict um, different vehicles, ATVs, uh, from certain areas and if we need to do that by ordinance, that's something that can be looked at. I want to get uh, info from the Parks and Rec director, Ms. Browder, city manager, but that's something we can look into. Okay. You can restrict any type of vehicle you want from that park as a governing body. 
Okay. Well, I will say it's an issue at Carver Park, and on yesterday I was walking at Shirley B. Winston Park, and we did two miles, you know, around the circumference of the park, and they're riding dirt bikes everywhere. And I mean, it's unfortunate that we spend the money to keep the grounds looking nice, and when you go to the park, that's all you see is, you know, in the the lines from how they're destroying the grass in the area. And not only that, um, I know that baseball season um, started and we had cleared the baseball fields and they took the four wheelers on the baseball fields and destroyed the baseball fields. So I, I do think um, that we need an ordinance in reference to the dirt bikes and four wheelers, the ATVs. So. Thank you, Mr. Carter, for letting me know. Thanks for the opportunity to address the council. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Garrett? Thank Unfortunately, you. this is not just happening in the parks. I almost got run over crossing Edgewood and Clubview uh, with my baby when I was going to visit my parents. They're about a quarter mile from me. And it's a real issue with minors. Uh, a lot of parents, particularly during COVID, when everybody got real hyped up on the golf carts, they start, now the kids are out driving ATVs like 45 miles an hour in my neighborhood, which is a 20, because we're by Clubview, and riding dirt bikes. And I'm talking like a kid came around a curb and I had to push my baby stroller into the yard. And these are kids that are like 12 and 13 who aren't even legal to drive. And it's uh, it's becoming a real issue in, in my district, in my neighborhood. and. Uh, the, just as a point of personal privilege, Mr. City Manager, if, with the issues we're having with vehicles, just normal vehicles flying at the intersection of Clubview and Edgewood, if we could possibly be on the T-SPLOSS list for a roundabout there, I think that'd be a great place for it. I talked to all the residents who live on that corner. Uh, none of them were opposed to that. They all have concerns about the speed of vehicles coming down that hill. Because, I mean, I basically have to wait until there are no cars coming, look both ways, and there's a crosswalk in an elementary school. And I've got to walk and I have to run across with the baby stroller just to cross Edgewood, which used to be a relatively slow road, but a lot of this is being caused by kids that are on dirt bikes and ATVs who aren't even old enough to drive and no helmets or anything. Mr. City Manager. And Ms. Mayor and uh, Councilor um, Garrett, I'll have staff to put that on our list to take a look at for um, possible roundabout. Okay. Yeah, I, Ms. Carter, thank you, sir. Uh, thank and, you. and the parks are there, and that's and that's the that's the frustration on the part of all of the members of council. I've heard every one of them comment at one point or another. If it's not Carver Park, it's Shirley Winston. It's 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 all of our public parks that the, they're put there for the enjoyment of the public. And there are those that would get more enjoyment out of destroying those parks than using them for what the way they were intended. Uh, so this council is aware of that. Uh, you've heard, uh, hopefully, you've heard that there are some uh, there's some sincere interest in perhaps coming up with some additional charges that can be levied. The big challenge, though, as Chief Blackman will tell you, is the enforcement. We have to be able to catch them there, and if they're on motorbikes, they ride up and down the streets, and they're gone before the police get there. So we'll we'll come up with something, uh, and I don't know if the chief has anything he wants to add. Uh, I know you've spoken with him beforehand, but Chief Blackman, if there's anything that you'd like to add, we'll give you an opportunity to do so, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Uh, as was previously stated, I have communicated with Mr. Thomas, excuse me, Mr. Carter, and we will work with him to do what we can do to enforce the activity there in the park. And so we'll be meeting with him to discuss it further. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. You know, maybe on some of these, thank you, sir. Maybe some of these golf carts we can begin to charge parents who allow their kids to go ride them through the streets. Maybe that'll get the message across. All right. Mr. City Manager, it's your agenda. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I've got. Um, an Atlanta Hawks Foundation grant, $1,750. Motion to approve from the Mayor Pro Tem, second from Councilor Tucker. Uh, any discussion? All in? Uh, sure. Um, 
there will be four awards uh, for this grant and the funding will be used to completely uh, uh, for scholarship in youth uh, or special needs participants who are unable to pay for participation. All right, there's a motion second on the table. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, no. That's approved. I've got uh, Georgia Recreation and Parks Association grant funding. It's $1,000. There's no match. All right, there's a motion to approve from Councilor Huff. I heard a second. Who made that second? Councilor Tucker? All right. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, no. And right. Mr. Attorney, Manager, if you would read what that is for. Yeah, uh, it's a new initiative grant program uh, intended to spur innovation in parks and recreation services um, at a local or regional level that ultimately could have statewide impact is what they're trying to do. I've got purchases. Um, I've got uh, Columbus Dragonfly Trails, and I, I would like for Deputy City Manager Hodge to show you what we're talking about here. It's a $2,080,732.09 uh, uh, construction project, and uh, she will show you the, where the new trail will run along 10th Avenue and 11th Street and 6th Avenue and so forth. Um, so it'll take just a few minutes to kind of show you what we've got going here. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, this is just an update. Um, when I went back to look at when we provided this update to Council, it was actually um, March the 10th. It was an in-person meeting on March the 10th. Um, we brought a resolution back to Council on March 24th, and that was the first virtual meeting that Council had. Um, so I don't know if you recall all the specifics of that, but I just want to briefly walk through this connection, which is from the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard uh, Trail to the Riverwalk. Uh, Kaizen Collaborative has completed the plans. Uh, this uh, design services were funded by the Friends of the Dragonfly Trail, so there was no cost to the city for the design of this uh, particular section, as well as other sections uh, that we've partnered with um, the Friends of the Dragonfly Trail and the PATH Foundation uh, to expand our trail network. Uh, this particular trail is outlined in red. Uh, so it will go from the existing MLK trail up 10th Avenue across 11th Street under the viaduct, down 6th Avenue, uh, down 10th Street, and then connect uh, to the Riverwalk. And I just have a few slides that will just kind of look at each particular section. Uh, there will be the section where we have the existing ramps. Uh, those will be widened to 10 feet. There will be the railing will be removed. Um, there will be some uh, erosion mitigation that's done with a concrete barrier, and the entrance to the zip line will be reconfigured. So on the uh, left-hand side is the existing uh, connection and what it will be on the right-hand side. Uh, then through Woodruff Park, there will be a new direct connection uh, leading to those um, crosswalks there. Um, there'll be additional landscaping between uh, the splash pad. Um, we did work with uh, CSU and Uptown Columbus to make sure that that property has been deeded to the city for this particular project. Uh, there will be some additional signage uh, because we want people to be uh, cautious going through that area. There's kids um, at the playground and at the um, splash pad. So going down 10th Street, we'll expand the sidewalk to 10 foot, uh, bump the curb out, uh, remove the existing on-street <clears throat> bike lane, uh, so that will put all of that traffic onto the existing or onto the path. Uh, we have coordinated uh, with the waterworks um, for this restriping as well. Uh, on 11th Street and 6th Avenue, we'll expand uh, that sidewalk to 10 feet. Uh, we'll move those parallel parking spaces. We have coordinated with the property owners in the area, uh, so they are aware that this project is coming. 
And again, this will maintain that left turn lane off of 11th Street onto 7th Avenue, and it will transition under that um, viaduct. And this will be what uh, it will look like on 11th Street on the underpass. So there will be a single lane uh, in one direction, uh, the dual lane in the other direction. So this, this is what's included in the contract that's in uh, up for consideration on the purchasing agenda. Uh, this is what uh, we are striving for, is to have some type of a light feature under that 11th Street viaduct. It is not part of this contract, uh, but we are moving forward with uh, working with the Friends of the Dragonfly Trail to create something similar to this, to have a light feature under uh, that viaduct. So we'll be re reducing the westbound lanes from two to one, uh, repave and expand the existing sidewalk to 11 feet. There'll be a concrete barrier installed uh, to separate the trail from the traffic. Uh, we are working to do some type of a, a light feature and to uh, stripe that uh, particular trail section. And then on 10th Avenue, we'll create the 10-foot wide trail, um, providing a six-feet uh, landscape uh, buffer, uh, remove that brick wall. We've worked with the Housing Authority to have an easement in that particular location and connect to the MLK Trail uh, there on uh, 10th Avenue. So this was just a reminder of what Council had already uh, reviewed and approved, uh, but it has been a year ago as we've kind of gone through COVID and completed that design work, and now we're ready to start construction. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. And Mr. Mayor, if there are no questions, I would ask for approval of item number A on the purchases. All right, there's a motion from Councilor Garrett and a second from Councilor Tucker, and there's comments from Councilor Huff. Yeah, what's the, uh, how long is the project? I From start to finish, I mean, that's all I'm asking. I do not know the you know? date on that, but I will get that to you. Yeah, it's, it's not urgent. I was just wondering if you knew to come in with good news that they say once we approve this, it'll be finished in I'll eight months, a year. Me. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Thanks. All right, any more discussion? There's a motion, second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, no? All right, that's approved. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and if I could just pause to... Um, express uh, the excitement that I feel about uh, what's going on in Uptown as we, I, I watched um, the slides here, um, and, and that is going to uh, come through our Uptown area and make improvements there as it connects with the river. Uh, but I had a chance to join the mayor yesterday um, to tour uh, the new AC hotel on Broadway. And I will tell you just to, to stand out front of that new hotel uh, is, um, is, is I, I can't even find the right word to express. And, and, and then when you get up on the second floor, I don't care which room you visit, you look um, go to and look out the window, uh, just a view, especially when you stand on the Broadway side and you look out over Broadway. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I'm trying to figure, am I in Columbus, Georgia? I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it, it's awesome. And I felt the same way a few weeks ago when I joined the mayor and we went to the Indigo. And, um, so, you know, as uh, Deputy City Manager Hodge was presenting, I, I said I'm going to have her get with uh, the President and CEO of Uptown and just do a, a PowerPoint tour of what's going on in Uptown so that we can show it here for people who don't get out much and don't know what's going on in the Uptown area. Um, it will blow your mind. I, you know, I have... I am so proud of Columbus, Georgia. I mean, I am proud. I, I, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Um, we, we've got a, a great city, and, and I'm just proud of it. But I had to 
just pause and we'll bring some things back on what's going on in Uptown. But you know, you can go to Panhandle and other places, it's happening there too, but, but it's exciting in Uptown. And um, Mayor, I just had to say that. <laughs> I share your enthusiasm. Um, item B, uh, Consolidated Plan Neighborhood Revitalization Strategy Area Plan, Annual Action Plan, and Analysis of Impediments to Fair Housing Choices. An RFP Mosaic Community Plan and LLC uh, will lead that process for us, and we're asking for your approval to move forward. All right, there's a motion to approve all the purchases, remaining purchases, B through K. Uh, and there, by the Mayor Pro Tem, seconded by Councilor Garrett. Are there any items that some, anybody like pulled for further discussion or further study? B, are oh, you want to pull B? Okay. Um, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and vote on C through K. Uh, since there is that motion second, uh, no further discussion. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed, no. All right, C through K is approved. And Mr. City Manager, if you would expand a little bit on the description of the item you just touched on, uh, item B, and then list the others, if you don't mind, please, or for the public. Um, yes, sir. Um, annually, um, we, we have a five-year consolidated plan through for community development block grant uh, and it uh, the plan will focus on expanding efforts uh, to revitalize the neighborhoods and provide housing opportunities through analysis of community housing market needs um, they look at housing stock socioeconomic uh, trends um, and identifying target housing and housing and uh, economic development areas and uh, so this company, uh, Mosaic Community Plan and LLC, um, they'll lead the process and it's a federal requirement, uh, meeting federal regulations and guidelines, and we often come back to you as we have to update the plan and we get new money coming in. Mm -hmm. And, um, but um, maybe I need to have the community development block grant or the community reinvestment director to come and kind of give an overview uh, on all of this so that the public can hear more about it. Councilor Tucker? Well, hang on, there we go. I, I was actually reading the item and um, it was some good information in there and that's why I wanted to sure. expound on it so people will know exactly that we're doing these type of studies and work to mm -hmm. improve on our neighborhoods and I, I do think that it, it, we should capture that type of information at the meeting. Sure. But I didn't mean, I just wanted more information. Sure. It wasn't to. Yep, so. let the public know, that's a good <laughs> idea. Uh, mm -hmm. Any more questions on item B? Hearing none, all in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed, no? All right, item B is approved as well. If you would please, Mr. City Manager, list the other items and purchases for the yes. public. Yes, sir. Uh, item C, laboratory services for engineering, uh, and it's uh, an agreement with the Columbus Water Work, uh, Works where they uh, do laboratory services, um, uh, and it's uh, an estimated uh, $5,200, uh, but uh, it's uh, with the Stormwater Management uh, Division uh, as they test uh, water samples for us. D, uh, zero turn radius. Uh, mowers for Parks and Rec, it's four of them. Um, e, uh, employee service awards, uh, pins. Uh, F uh, would be speed limit feed, uh, feedback, radar signals, and that is where we put the radar signals on signposts in neighborhoods and we can move them around. Uh, you see them in some of the other cities. Um, maintenance, repair, and operations, industrial supplies and tools on an as-needed basis is G. Uh, H um, is uh, furniture uh, for the Columbus Fire and EMS Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security. We're trying to upgrade our emergency operations center and they do need furniture and um, other things in that office that uh, they've not had for 
um, many, many years, uh, I believe since the building was constructed in 1996. And so it, it's, it's time to make it a real emergency operations center, um, an upgrade from what we have today. Uh, we have recycling containers for public works, uh, repair of a uh, bulldozer uh, for public works, and then K, uh, maintenance extension for net app, uh, network storage, uh, and um, yeah, that, and that was K, that was the final one. Uh, those are all of the purchases. Um, I do have just a few um, updates. Uh, and the first one uh, is uh, State of Georgia Rental Assistance Program update. And I think, uh, Councilor Tucker, uh, you'd be interested in hearing this since you did ask a question about the consolidation plan. And we will bring him back another time uh, regarding the consolidation plan. But um, we need to know, the community needs to know about this rental assistance uh, program. And uh, we've got Rob Scott, our Director of Community Reinvestment in Real Estate here with us today. Mr. Scott. Thank you so much, Mr. City Manager. Uh, as many of you know, on uh, February 19th, Governor Brian Kemp have introduced a new rental assistance program uh, through the state of Georgia. The program is designed to provide rental assistance to tenants. Um, and Congress appropriated more than $550 million to this project. Um, we have recently received information through the most recent congressional appropriation um, that the program will continue on and it has the potential to exceed uh, more than $1 billion. So we want to make sure that we provide as much information as possible. Um, and we're here today to talk about uh, uh, the program um, and as it relates to our community and across the state. The State of Georgia Rental Assistance Program is a program being administered by the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. It is designed to help both renters and landlords seek uh, to get restitution for um, missed rent throughout the pandemic, um, as well as utility assistance, and both tenants and landlords must apply. The payments include arrearages and future payments of up to three months with a maximum per household of $15,000, and it generally may not exceed 12 months. Uh, the income limits for the participants of this program cannot have combined incomes of less than 80% of the area median income, um, which is evidenced by the third row on the income limit summary sheet that is uh, on the screen. There are some additional eligibility conditions that must be met. Um, the family should qualify for unemployment benefits or has experienced a reduction in household income or incurred significant costs during the pandemic or experienced other financial hardship due directly or indirectly to COVID-19. In addition, the household must demonstrate a risk of experiencing homelessness or housing instability and as I mentioned previously, they should be at or below 80% of the area median income for Columbus, um, with special priority given to those households with very low income who are designated at a 50% AMI level, or to households with one or more individuals who have been unemployed 90 days or longer at the time of the application. The City of Columbus residents and landlords will self-apply for the Rental Assistance Program directly through the Department of Community Affairs website. That website address is georgiarentalassistance.ga.gov or they can contact DCA directly and that phone number is 833-827-RENT or 833-827-7368. When we partnered with DCA to bring um, the program here to spread the word about it, we wanted to make sure that we were able to mitigate some of the barriers that some of the populations would have when it comes to accessing this type of program. So some of the barriers that we identified was accessibility via equipment, which just simply means computers, um, programmatic knowledge, which is the, the specific details of what's required to be a participant of the program, as well as internet access. So to mitigate some of those barriers, 
my department has worked to create navigation stations and navigators. Navigation stations are spaces that will only offer computer and internet access. In addition, they will also offer FAQs and flyers about the program. The J. Barnett Woodruff Boys and Girls Club is a navigation station. So are the Mildred L. Terry Public Libraries, the Columbus Public Library, the North Columbus Public Library, as well as the South Columbus Public Library. Also, we have worked to help create navigators, and navigators are nothing more than social service agencies that will case manage clients throughout the application process, including the collection and submission of required documentation. Today, I'm pleased to announce that there are approximately seven navigators that are within our community, and those include St. Anne Community Outreach, Enrichment Services, United Way of the Chattahoochee Valley, the Salvation Army, Homeless Resource Network, Access to Independence, and Georgia Legal Services. I would like to say thank you to Sheriff Greg Countryman and Clerk of Municipal Court Reginald Thompson. Through our partnership, we have worked to identify more than 200 landlords who have filed for eviction um, since March of 2020. Um, and we've worked to create correspondence to notify these landlords, to tell them about this program um, that will increase the housing stability um, of the tenants who are under the eviction, as well as the landlords. And to, is it just an attempt to, to bring both sides of the table to have the same information in order to uh, get access to the program? Um, we developed the correspondence, we addressed the restitution through the program, and I'm pleased to announce that Roughly 117 landlords um, attended the two virtual sessions that we had, representing roughly 57% of the total population of the correspondence that we put out there. So we were pleased to see uh, such high attendance from that side. Um, are there any questions about anything that I've spoke about today? Well, I- Doesn't appear so. And, and Mr. Mayor, I- I just want to um, thank um, Rob Scott for his leadership um, in this effort to make sure that Columbus Muskogee residents uh, take advantage of this rental assistance that includes utilities. And with these navigator stations and navigator locations, um, I hope that citizens will hear this on CCG TV. I hope the news media will publicize it. Uh, if you know someone and you're listening who could benefit from this rental assistance uh, and utility payments, tell them about it. Uh, have them call 311, get connected to the community reinvestment office so that they can direct them uh, they've contacted uh, 117 um, property owners who are renting, and it's the property owner and their tenant. It's in the property owner's interest if he or she or their business want to collect that back rent, and, um, and even utility companies can get their utility payments. Uh, they need to take advantage of this. There's a lot of money on the table that we cannot leave on the table when people have not been able to pay their rent. So I'm talking about it because I want people to hear it. And um, don't miss out on this opportunity for rental assistance and get your utility back, uh, your utility bills paid that you've, where you've not been able to pay. Uh, thank you, um, Scott, for you, what you and your staff have done. Rob, if I could, Mr. Timmy, I just want to add up how much I appreciate all the work that you put into this, I would I would also suggest, and you probably already have, but maybe contact you, United Way, uh, the 211 information line. Make sure that this is at least temporarily put on there if you haven't already. We uh, have but we have been in contact with Miss Mundy, and we have already taken care of that side. Good. Sir. And there's uh, there's a I mean the state is really pushing this initiative. Uh, matter of fact, we're hoping to get the uh, commissioner of DCA down here, and he's going to be delighted 
to see the steps that uh, Columbus, Georgia has taken under your leadership in getting this done. Great, great job. Councilor so. Tucker. Thank you, Director Scott. Um, you actually told me about this, I think a couple of weeks ago when I came to visit you. I will be doing a radio show thanks to my, my seatmate, Councilor Barnes, on 101.3, and I will make sure I mention this on that radio show. So thank you for this information. Thank you, Councilor Tucker. Um, Mr. Mayor, if there are no other questions, we'll have the finance director to do the monthly finance update. Councilor Thomas. Uh, Mr. City Manager, while she's coming up, so if people have questions about this program, just call 311? Well, I I'm suggesting 311 because that's easier for them to call 311 and then let them direct the call. Uh, but certainly they can call the Office of Community Reinvestment and, and get information. Uh, the director gave us a lot of information and there may be somebody that needs some, uh, you know, expansion of some of that. But yes. if they call 311 and ask for community redevelopment, that's right. That'll do it, won't it? Yes. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. So, um, what you have before you um, tonight is the uh, monthly financial snapshot as of February uh, 2021. And I do apologize that all the numbers don't display there for the general fund, but um, the general fund is up 2.98% uh, when comparing February 2021 to February 2020. Um, the February 2020 amount was uh, just over uh, $116 million. Um, so that uh, is about a $4 million difference in terms of um, dollars there. I just wanted to point that out since that number didn't display. Um, the other local option sales tax fund is up 19.71%. Of course, you know that number includes the one-time audit amount that we received from the Department of Revenue. Um, if we do not take that amount into account, the uh, other local option sales tax fund would still be up about 6%. The stormwater sewer fund is up 2.05%. The paving fund is up 2.34%. Um, again, these funds are mainly supported by tax revenues. Um, so, uh, also, the uh, medical center fund is up 1.62%. The integrated waste fund here is up 20% um, in terms of the revenues, and that is uh, due to the critical equipment purchase, well, subsidy that was provided to that fund from the general fund. So it counts in terms of revenues as a transfer into that fund, um, and that's why it's showing the 20% there. The emergency telephone fund is down 5.80%. Um, uh, as I mentioned previously, the um, 911 contract with Chattahoochee County, that ended as of uh, April 1st, 2020. And so um, the um, revenues are reflected of the uh, discontinuation of that particular contract. But the fund is looking good overall in terms of um, the expenditures that we um, have in it. Uh, the Economic Development Authority Fund is up 1.62 percent. Um, the Debt Service Fund is down 40.41 percent. Um, this again uh, is due to the bond refinancing that took place in uh, FY20. And so um, that's why you see that significant difference there. Um, next year it'll normalize back to uh, what it uh, should be, uh, which is about the same in, in terms of the debt obligations that we make from this um, particular fund. The transportation fund is up 3.28%. Um, the Trade Center fund is down 12.58%. And although the revenues are down, the expenditures are down well, as well about 5%. Um, Bull Creek Golf Course fund up 51.75%. Oxbow Creek up 83.51%. And the Civic Center Fund is down 81.85%. Uh, 
And again, the revenues are down, but so are the expenditures. The expenditures are down about 62% from where they were in FY20. Moving down the snapshot to the other local option sales tax summary for public safety. Um, year to date, we've recorded about 19 million in revenues, about 20.2 million in expenditures. Uh, for the uh, infrastructure side of the other local option sales tax uh, monies, uh, we've recorded about $8.1 million in revenue and about $3.4 million in expenditures. So if you just move to the uh, left side of the snapshot there in terms of the general fund expenditures, the goal um, at this particular point is to be at or above about 33% from a budget standpoint. And for the ones that aren't at that goal, are, uh, those are highlighted here in yellow. Um, so just starting with the city attorney's litigation, obviously we're still you know, defending millions in claims for that. Uh, for information technology, um, that is due to, a, a lot of it is due to the maintenance agreements that we have in place that are really sort of coming due towards the end of the fiscal year here, as well as the COVID equipment. I don't anticipate that uh, being an issue for the department um, as we close out the fiscal year. The employee benefits, um, that's due to annual death benefit and major disability payments. Again, those are one-time payments. I don't anticipate any problems uh, for that uh, as we uh, move towards the end of the fiscal year. For uh, real estate here, um, that is due to the um, building maintenance and repairs for Legacy Terrace. Of course, um, we do receive revenues. Uh, for uh, rental income that's paid at Legacy Terrace, so it's really offset by revenues here. Um, the um, elections budget, um, we're still watching that. We're still, you know, it's amazing at this time, we're still really sort of working through some of the expenditures for elections and making sure that, um, you know, we, we are, we've applied them appropriately to all of the funding sources that they've um, had this fiscal year, but um, they're on the watch list because of their percentage, as well as Homeland Security. Um, they're currently on the watch list um, as well. Um, the Public Defender's um, Office is due to the monthly uh, contract that we pay in advance. And the Marshal's Office is highlighted here, but that's nothing. I actually could remove that um, from the report. And that in itself is uh, the update as of February 2021, and I'll be glad to answer any questions if you have them. I don't think there are any. All right, thank you. Okay, and uh, Mr. Mayor, um, the final update is just uh, the video that we would like to show you. We've talked about the stress, dilapidated properties, and trying to notify those who own uh, the stress or dilapidated properties. We did do the video that I talked about, and uh, I'd like for them to just run that eight minute video. The city of Columbus is working to clean up dilapidated properties in neighborhoods throughout the city. The city's inspections and codes department is encouraging the following property owners to take immediate action to repair your properties by bringing them up to city code or remove them by demolition. If the property owner fails to take immediate action, the city's private contractor will demolish the dilapidated property and the city will place a lien on the property to recoup taxpayer dollars. Property owners, please watch the video. If you own any of these properties, please help Columbus improve neighborhoods for a better Columbus, taking immediate action on your dilapidated property. 1000 Peachtree Drive, owner Rocky Carlos Garcia. 2816 Baldwin Street, owner Joe and Lucinda Collier. 235 Collins Drive, owner James Pearson and Melanie Smizowski. 930 Dozier Street, owner Howard and Marquise Jackson. 4720 Century Street, owner Kenneth and Lillian Howard. 4131 2nd Avenue, owner Cash King LLC. 4738 12th Avenue, owner J.L. Johnson. 3626 Irwin Way, owner Robert F. Kirby Jr. 1359 Warm Springs Road, owner Dean King. 
2068 Mason Street, owner Charles Patrick. 4212 7th Avenue, owner Brenda Louise Lewis. 717 42nd Street, owner O.K. Son Thornburg. 2920 10th Street, owner Omar Martin. 345 Liberty Avenue, owner Abby Bridgen. 2439 Howe Avenue, owner Joseph W. Powell II. 220 Kelly Avenue, owner Vicki Moore Morgan. 2125 South Andrew Circle, owner Catherine and William Bowden. 906 Brooks Road, owner Richard and Eloise Brooks. 1337 20th Street, owner Larry Bussey. 1025 42nd Street, owner Travis Jackson. 918 38th Street, owner Charlie Lee Hawkins. 6800 Macon Road, owner Alberry Properties LLP. 37 Mason Drive, owner Jesse McCrae. 2315 Hamilton Road, owner Clay Alexander. 610 24th Street, owner Mark Rose. 735 5th Avenue, owner Justin Smith. 729 5th Avenue, owner Justin Smith. 4935 Vista Road, owner Billy Joe Tyler and estate of Cheryl Harrington. 4258 Meritas Drive, owner Grace Collinsworth. 1209 Carmel Court, owner Deborah Burns. 222 28th Avenue, owner Hattie Bass. 2631 Casita Road, owner estate of Floyd P. Redding and Richard Redding. 2908 Beacon Avenue, owner Donna J. Petticord. 729th Street, owner Vine C. and Louise Long. 201 32nd Avenue, owner Wilhelmina Lewis. 271 Mason Street, owner Janice Anita Collins. 81 Lafayette Drive, owner Crawford Beach Smith Jr. 1082 Lawyers Lane, owner Roscoe Boutwell. 802 Benning Drive, owner Flora Lyles. 4434 Mahaffey Street, owner Randy Allen Mears. 1102 Winston Road, owner Frank and Edna Turbin. 915 Fort Benning Road, owner Gerald Williams. 1014 Calvin Avenue, owner Estate of Floyd P. Reddy. 909 Charleston Avenue, owner Josephine W. Banks Life Estate. 378 Clover Avenue, Owner Henry and Ozella Edwards. 600 8th Street, owner Philip and Thomas Real Estate Holdings, LLC. 920 Diggs Avenue, owner Dorothy L. Kimbrough. 3313 7th Avenue, owner Betty Jean and Albert G. Currington. 2500 Shaw Street, owner the Victory Group, LLC. 370 28th Avenue, owner Three Ports Investments, LLC. 2314 14th Avenue, owner Oscar James Willis. 1414 24th Street, owner Legacy One Investors Group. 776 Terminal Court, owner Johnny L. General. 1103 22nd Street, owner Covenant, LLC. 2443 Y Street, owner Paz G. Pedrazo Trust. 3822 Third Avenue, owner Lange Realty LLC, Justin H. Lange. 2547 Panola Avenue, owner Three Port Investments LLC. 303 48th Street, owner John F. Law Jr. 3106 Urban Avenue, owner Adana Desmona Cheney. 2600 14th Avenue, owner Dennis Deal. 1524 15th Avenue, owner Deborah M. and Larry R. Lee. 167 Munson Avenue, owner Geraldine Toller Owens. 3001 4th Avenue, owner Timothy Jabari Mackey. 5912 Glendon Drive, owner Willie C. Smith. In demolition process. 988 Far Road, owner Park Village LLC, Jerry Newman. 119 Wayside Avenue, owner James Island and Patrick McKinnon. 2317 Forsyth Street, owner Jerquis Cheney. 951 Watson Drive, owner Fruition Real Estate LLC. 4703 Connor Road, owner Yanita Arrington. 326 29th Avenue, 
owner Michael Baldwin. 2346 Shelby Street, owner Earl and Alice Harrington. 931 Fifth Avenue, owner Lul LLC. 3005 Ormond Drive, owner Willie C. Gibson. 33 Eddy Drive, owner Miguel Villa. 96 40th Street, owner Earl Davis. 1129th Street, owner Belt Investment Group, LLC, James Thau. 3605 4th Avenue, owner Columbus Housing Initiative, Incorporated. 3213 6th Avenue, owner Lauren Hodge Trust. 1419 Warm Springs Road, owner Minius FG Asset Holding Trust. 5947 Lawson Street, owner Danny K. Denny. 2937 Colorado Street, owner Young Cook Pack and Young Ho and Family Value Realty, LLC. 27 Munson Drive, owner Alpesh Kumar Patel. 2545 Pi Avenue, owner estate of Gracie Mae Johnson. 2505 Hamilton Road, owner Deborah R. Gruber. 1502 Virginia Street, owner Ed Wawinder Jr. 615 Park Chester Drive, owner Brian Price. 3229 6th Avenue, owner Sally L. Dunlap. 827 Benning Drive, owner Benning B. Real Estate Holding. 3402 4th Avenue, owner Justin W. Jordan. 21 Matthew Street, owner George Kibbe Jr. 2215 1st Avenue, owner Clinton D. Hammond II and Joel D. Hammond. 2610 14th Avenue, owner Jerome Barnes. 3232 Urban Avenue, owner Isabel Spence. 2319 14th Avenue, owner Holton Group LLC. 6035 Mill Branch Road, owner John Moore. 1348 24th Street, owner Terrell Scott. 3025 Bonanza Drive, owner Peter J. Wheeler. 4009 Young Avenue, owner Brian and Automateo Florin. 406 17th Avenue, owner 406 14th Avenue, LLC. Property owners, if you own any of these properties, please help Columbus improve neighborhoods for a better Columbus by taking immediate action on your dilapidated property. Now, if you see a dilapidated structure in the community, call 311 and report the address. If you own a dilapidated structure, contact Inspections and Code at 706-653-4126. So, Mr. Mayor and Council, we have got to clean up Columbus. Uh, can you imagine any of those properties in your neighborhoods? And so those who are watching by television, I hope if you know the owner or owners, that you will call them and ask them to clean up, help us clean up Columbus. They are not living next to properties like that, those owners, and they shouldn't expect other citizens of this city to live next door or on streets with properties such as this. And so this will be running continuously on CCG TV. I've asked staff to put it on a uh, YouTube video and we're going to be posting it all over Facebook. And so if you don't catch it on CCG TV, just catch it on Facebook. And then tell your friends, if they're your friends and they own these ugly, dilapidated, distressed properties, that they can treat Columbus better than what you see on this video. Yes, sir. Councilor Garrett? Can we get an email list? Because I was, as quick as that video was going, I was texting two people who I know have the money to replace their properties, and they said they had no, no realization. One of them's been ill, and one of them lives in South Africa. And... Uh, they said they will take care of them immediately, but I couldn't write down the addresses in time if we could get an email with that list, and they'll well, take care of them. Yeah, yeah, I asked staff today, uh, Mayor, I think you were on with us, when I asked them to email, uh, email the video to each of the members of council okay. and then post it on Facebook, so you will get it via a YouTube video. Thank you. And, uh, and I will say that uh, our Inspections and Codes Director, Ryan Pruitt, um, 
indicated to us that since the video has been running on CCG TV, uh, these owners are calling him. And some are calling him wanting to get their name off the list and clean up the properties. Well, I think it's outstanding. We are, we are extremely serious about trying to clean up some of these dilapidated properties in the Blight in Columbus. Uh, Blight is a contributor. I mean, just like we had that Litter League uh, the other week, Blight is a big contributor to everything from poverty to education to food insecurity to crime. So the more of those we can get down, and, and we'd really rather have the owners take them down at their own expense so that they don't have any type of encumbrance on the title when they, when they go to sell. Well, Mayor, that concludes my agenda. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. For the clerk's agenda, first I have a resolution excusing Councilor Crabb from today's meeting. Motion approved from Mayor Pro Tem, second from Councilor Garrett. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. That's approved. Item two is a resolution canceling the April 6th and Mo May 2nd proclamation sessions. All right, motion approved from Councilor Garrett, second from uh, Mayor Pro Tem. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. It's approved. Next, I received a memorandum from the Human Resources Director uh, regarding the Employee Benefits Committee. Uh, the results of a survey for the Public Safety Representative uh, where Mr. Lance Deaton was selected to serve another term of office, and he may be confirmed. Motion approved from Mayor Pro Tem, second from Council Thomas. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. All right. Motion to receive the minutes from Councilor Garrett, second from Mayor Pro Tem. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. They are received. Mr. Mayor, I did have an add-on resolution to excuse Councilor Whitson from today's meeting. Motion approved from Councilor Garrett, second from the Mayor Pro Tem. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. Approved. That's passed. Next, we have board appointments. We have, Mr. Mayor, your appointment to the Housing Authority of Columbus. Did you want to? We, we want to reappoint Larry Carden for another term. He may be confirmed. Motion approved from Mayor Pro Tem, second from Councilor Garrett. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. Mr. Cardin's confirmed. Next, we have council district appointments. Any nominations may be confirmed for this meeting for the Civic Center Advisory Board. We have available the council district six seat. For the Community Development Advisory Council, we have the district seven and district nine seats available. For the Keep Columbus Beautiful Commission, we have the District 5 seat available. For the Recreation Advisory Board, we have the Council District 6, 6 seat available. Next, we have Council appointments. Any nominations would be listed for the next meeting. <clears throat> for the Board of Elections and Registration, for the seat of Eleanor White, Mayor Pro Tem Allen is nominating Dr. Edwin Rolden. If there are no further nominees, I will bring this back for confirmation at the next meeting. For the Commission on International Relations and Cultural Liaison Encounters, for the seat of Rose Spencer, Councilor Woodson is nominating Marva Barto. If there are no other nominees, we will bring this one back for confirmation at the next regular meeting. For the Employees Benefit Committee, for the seat of Bill Ron. Uh, at the last meeting, Councilor Woodson had renominated Mr. Ron to serve another term of office. However, since that time, he has withdrew his name for consideration. The Human Resources Department is now recommending Jonathan Kevin Lott. He's with the Fire and EMS Department to Councilor succeed Thomas. Mr. Ron. Um, Madam Clerk, um, <clears throat> go back up to the resolution um, Oh, number item number three. How is that different from this one? Mr. Uh, Major Deaton has been uh, approved for that one, and then this 
This is also that um, employee benefits commission committee, is it not? That's correct, Councilor Thomas. The difference is that the public safety employees, they are the ones that select that uh, nominee, the seat of Mr. Lance Deaton. The public safety employees uh, select that nominee and the council selects Mr. Bill Ron's seat. So there are two seats that are um, uh, reserved for sworn officers. That, that is committee. correct, Councilor Thomas. Okay, I just want to make sure that yeah, I, I, I've got that. Okay, thank you. Well, and, and I'm not certain both have to be sworn officers. One is a public safety representative chosen uh, by the public safety department in a poll from, from HR. Is that correct? And then the other is reserved for a sworn officer that this council recommends. Right, the one for the, has to be a public safety personnel and the human resources department conducts a survey of the public safety and that is how they come up with that nominee. Okay. With which nominee? Uh, the seat of Mr. Deaton. Lance Deaton, the public safety or law enforcement representative position. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I did not hear. Uh, did a member of council want to make that nomination of uh, Mr. Lott? Mayor Pro Tem did. Thank you. Next, we have the tree board. We have three seats that are open for nominations. Councilor Tucker is nominating Farrah Dewsbury to succeed Beverly Kenner as the at-large member. If there are no further nominees, we will bring this back at the next meeting for confirmation. And that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right, uh, Ms. Ledeni, are you still present? Yes, ma'am. You, you're welcome to come back to the podium uh, to resume your comments. You'll have three minutes to, uh, to finish those, ma'am. And uh, once again, just state your name and your address, and we'll start the timer right after that. No problem. Um, Jennifer Lee Denny at 2440 Diane Avenue. Thank you. All right. And um, continue on GCAL. The reason why I am suggesting for our public safety entities to start introducing the families to GCAL is, as we know, um, the need for resources and how they shift um, and how offices are moved are based on data. Um, they're all data driven. And part of the problems that we're running into when we're requesting for things like a GCAL office to be closer to um, Columbus versus Atlanta, or when we're requesting for beds to be at the medical um, at Piedmont Medical, um, when they you know reach a crisis when they reach a crisis and have to go to a group home or another facility, is they're saying that there are no needs. We're not showing any needs. And so when these families are calling GCAL. It documents the needs and it starts um, data showing that, hey, you know, Columbus is showing needs for those with Down syndrome, those for autism, those for bipolar disorder, juveniles, um, young adolescents, adults. It gives them data driven information um, for when they make their choices on where they're going to move offices to. Um, one example is we finally have the 44 beds for West Central. That was mostly based, if I'm understanding correct, on advocacy, not just on needs. Um, and it took a lot of advocacy years and years at the Capitol to get those 44 beds. And we know we have a large mental health population here. GCAL touches all of this. So I would like to see us um, reach out to Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities to start issuing out cards with GCAL's number also a means to contact constituent services to hold them accountable so we get those services to those families and in turn this will help take this heavy lifting off of our public safety officials does anyone have any questions no ma'am it doesn't appear so all right
right. Um, like I said, I would love to meet. Um, it wouldn't just be myself. It would be other community advocates that have been in this longer than I have. I'm just beginning because I've been tied up with my son. He's nine, so there's a lot more that goes into play. And I'm finally getting freed up to be able to do a lot more in the neighborhoods well, like, and in the communities. So. It's outstanding information, and, and I, I would urge you to forward it to council uh, so that we have, have access to it. Councilor Tucker? I just want to say thank you, um, Ms. Ladini, and thank you for contacting me about um, Mr. King, um, who actually, when you called and texted me, I was at Chester's Barbecue, and it was a group of people, a lot of people out there, oh, wow. and I didn't know what was going on. So I was able to assist in that effort because you contacted me. So thank you so much. Thank you for helping as well. Thank you, ma'am. You'll have a great night. Thank you. You too. Thank you for waiting. Uh, Madam Clerk, did I cut you off too quick? Uh, oh. No, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my agenda was complete. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Councilor Thomas. Um, Mr. Mayor, I, I just want to make a uh, note for those who may be listening of the excellent um, ceremony that we had last Friday to uh, name the Citizen Service Center uh, for former Councilor uh, Red McDaniel. And I want to give a special thanks to uh, Deputy City Manager uh, Lisa Goodwin for her um, work in putting all that together. If you could have made it a little warmer, it would have been better, but uh, the overall was, was delightful. And it was, it was really a lot of um, fun, I guess is the word, to hear stories from various counselors about their um, work with Red McDaniel, Councilor Red McDaniel and, and how much that uh, has impacted our city. But it was a, a, a delightful um, ceremony, and uh, I'm glad that we had taken the um, initiative to make that naming uh, possible. And I think his family enjoyed it too, particularly the C.E. Red McDaniel III, the great grandson who was four years old, something like that. He was delighted that his name was on that building. <laughs> Well, and thank you for mentioning that, and I too will give a, a, a great big thank you to Deputy City Manager Lisa Goodwin. You, you saw the fruits of her labor and what a great job she did. You have no idea how long she's been nudging and pushing. We tried to get that done, and then COVID hit. And then when, when COVID finally started to ease a little bit where we felt comfortable at least getting people socially distanced in attendance, Mrs. McDaniel was having some health issues, and then uh, after her passing, her unfortunate passing, it took a while for the family to get everything settled before they could come back. So Lisa, great job, great patience, and thank you for, the family was absolutely awed by your work. We, we appreciate it. So that, that, that building will be known as the CE Red McDaniel Citizen Service Center. All right, any further business to come before the council? All right, there's a motion to adjourn from Councilor Garrett, second from the Mayor Pro Tem. All in favor, please say aye. Any opposed, no. All right, have a great week.